Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. This is my 38th interview of the Devotional Hearts Show. And as a lot of you know, I am seeking clergy members and authors mainly to be my guests at this point. And so I'm very, very blessed today to have a very special clergy member. His name is Father Zechariah Lynch. And I discovered him from Patristic Faith. And I'm also following him on Instagram and he has a blog called the inkless pen blog. And I just find so much guidance, wisdom, and, um, just it, it, his blog posts really help remind me what's important in our faith and helps me discern <laughs> because we have to see how the enemy is working against us in the world. And Father Lynch has done an excellent job explaining how the enemy works. And so without further ado, I would love to introduce you to my very special guest, Father Zechariah. Welcome. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's a real blessing to be here with you. Um, and just by God's grace, um, I don't know a little bit about myself. I mean, um, you know, I know it's sweep kind of sweeping terms. I, I grew up, you know, typical. Uh, my dad was a, a Protestant minister. Um, so I grew up as a, a PK in Protestantism. I would say um, one of the, the most impactful things that happened to me as a young a teenager because uh, I was, you know, my dad was a pastor in uh, Central California, uh, Santa Maria area. Um, and I was part of kind of just, you know, typical California culture at that time. Uh, so early 90s, my parents made the decision to, um, I mean, they're Protestants, of course, but they made the decision to, to move over to uh, the country that's now everyone's talking about, Ukraine. Um, so in the early 90s, my parents moved the whole family. Um, I was in my mid-teens over to the Ukraine. Um, I, you know, I wasn't, you know, typical. I, I, I didn't really take my, my faith seriously as a, as a teenager moving to Ukraine, I would say was one of the biggest, um, you know, uh, influences on my life. Now I wasn't Orthodox yet. It was where I encountered Orthodoxy first. Um, and you know, it's like, like a lot of things they have to work down in your heart. Uh, it took me some time to process, um, but it's a unique time when I went there. It was right after what is known as perestroika. Um, and so, so life was much different. I went from Southern California kind of culture, surf culture as a surfer um, to standing in line, you know, to get bread. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, we did missionary work there. I met my wife. My, my, my wife's from Ukraine. Um, of course, we've been pretty occupied the past few days because we yeah. still have family in the Ukraine and and with everything that's unfolding there. Um, but came came back that really changed. You know, in in America, I was you know I was the typical kind of skeptical PK kid. You know, Christians are hypocrites. Um, you know, on it that kind of thing. Jesus might be real. He did some his his words are are pretty neat. But but I you know just Christians, you know, there's, but when I went to Ukraine, I, even though they were Protestants, I encountered people that really suffered that really you know, gave their, you know, I remember there, you, you do the typical kind of American thing. Oh, that's, that's nice. You know, I like your, whatever it is, your kind, and they just give it to you. What? I didn't mean, you know, I'm just trying to be polite and they had nothing really. And they just share things with you. There was just mm -hmm. So that it impacted me, it really turned my heart in, in that sense back back towards Christ, um, and and that began my journey towards Orthodoxy. Um, I did visit churches there, um, you know. No, yeah, but was able to visit the Kiev Cave Lavra. I mean, I was a Protestant. I just would go down, and people probably aren't familiar with it, but it's a cave system um, in Kiev, and it's full of relics. A lot of them incorrupt. I mean, it's it's just. Wow. And it's amazing. So of course I'm from Central Coast California, and I'm I'm down there. Wow, they have all these dead guys down here. <laughs> it just blew my mind. Um, and I'm convinced, really, and I mention all that because I I'm really convinced that uh, the saints, because we know the saints are alive with Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, they saw me as kind of this poor uh, American Californian punk, you know, wandering the Kiev caves, just completely really lost and probably began to pray for me, even though I didn't even ask them to yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm convinced that 
through their prayers, um, you know, I was, I was able to make my way because really I'm not smart enough to do that on my own. So there had to be some kind of help. Uh, so, so that's, you know, I came back to America, attended a, a Protestant Bible college, um, thinking that I would go into to Protestant ministry. Uh, and like a lot of people, I was, um, uh, I was seeking, you know, you're seeking something more. You, you, you read the scriptures, something resounds in your heart. I had encountered what I, I considered to be true and authentic people, um, especially in Ukraine. Uh, but you, you still long for something more, something of more depth and substance than, than generally what is known as, as Christendom in the West um, has to offer. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's what eventually um, brought me to orthodoxy, reading my way. Um, I'm, I'm mostly of uh, Irish, Scottish descent. Um, so reading about the early church in those areas um, was very impactful for me also. Uh, and, 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 you know, uh, so in the early 2000s, my wife was also, even though she was from Ukraine, she wasn't, she wasn't Orthodox. Um, she, you know, grew up Soviet Union. So they're not with no religion in her home. Uh, so we became Orthodox together, actually, in the early 2000s with our, our a few of our children at that time. Uh, and then, you know, although I, I as a prod, you know, as a young uh, Protestant, I, I, I wanted to serve. Yeah, you know, I guess I wanted to I wanted to do something as a Protestant in my mind. I thought, you know, if I'm going to do something with my life, I want to do something that has meaning, you know, I, uh, I don't want to just give myself over to kind of the typical consumerism and materialism that seemed to be, I mean, it's hard to escape. I mean, I can't say that I'm, I'm free from that. I'm still, but you know, in my, you know, that's what I wanted is I wanted to get what, what is real, what is authentic. And those kind of questions, I think if people are asking them, will, will essentially bring you uh, hopefully to, to truth, to Christ. Um, and so, so we converted. Um, I was on my way to be a Protestant minister. I laid, I laid that down, tried to just be Orthodox for a while. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't know, sometimes I, I look back, you know, being a priest is, and I don't, I don't, you know, I mean it in the, in the sense that we might use it, you know, it's a, it's a terrible thing to be a priest. <laughs> uh, and that doesn't mean kind of in the modern, but it's, it's a fearful thing. And uh, it's, it's uh, the longer I'm a priest, the more, um, the more I'm, you know, uh, you know, kind of uh, fear struck in the pause in the, uh, hopefully in the positive sense of, of what, what I've, you know, is, uh, you know, by God's grace have undertaken. Um, so when I was, I entered the church and just tried to be Orthodox, tried to absorb as much as I could in America um, some of those things, but that, that longing, I think it's, there's something to that. We have to listen to our heart. We have to listen to, um, the inner person and, and, um, that, that desire to do, to, to continue to serve the Lord mm -hmm. some level was still there. So in, you know, uh, counsel with those who were, um, uh, spiritual counsel for me at that time, um, uh, decided to go to seminary. Uh, and so I, I don't know, that's kind of in broad strokes, uh, how, how I became a priest. That was, I went to seminary in 2008. I graduated in 2011. And I've been, um, you know, at the, the same parish since my graduation. So it's been over 10 years now. Wow. So. I loved what you said about reading yourself into orthodoxy. And as you know, one of the reasons I started this channel is to hear people's conversion stories. And I just I love hearing that over and over that also what you said about looking for truth. If your if your heart is sincere in its desire to know the truth, it's going to lead you to orthodoxy. And um, what are some of the, the fathers or some of the books that you recommend to new, um, like to a catechumen like myself? Are, are there, or do you, do you kind of ask the person individually to find out what would be the right book for them to read? Or do you have a few that are just like great for everybody? Well, when people, I, I have the, I'll call it a luxury right now of, you know, when people, I mean, we have catechumens, thank God. Um, and, and, but usually in a, in a steady stream that I'm able to try to 
uh, deal with deal with them more on a, on a personal level, so to speak. Um, but a few, you know, a book I, I usually always recommend. Um, it's one of, and I have catechumens always read. It's a small book. It's by Saint Innocent of Alaska. It's a, um, instru instructions on the way to the kingdom of heaven. I believe is the the name. And and he wrote that as a catechism for the Aleuts. I, I still reread it. It's a beautiful book. Uh, just uh, it's an incredible book. Uh, Saint Saint uh, Theophon the Recluse. Um, uh, his his um, his book on the spiritual life and how to be attuned to it. Uh, it's a, it's a letters correspondence uh, very much. So that's about the spiritual life, which I think is is very important. Because I mean, although we read ourselves, a lot of us we kind of read history. We realize something, you know, especially coming from out the, the the typical Protestant milieu. Um, you kind of, at least I did. You know, I felt something's not something's lacking. You know, you you feel. I think, and there's something to that because, you know, God, Christ is merciful and he's going to deal with us where we are and what we know, you know, so, um, but his desire is that all men would come to the, the truth, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, as, as sometimes Protestants, a lot of them, or some people, a lot of them, they haven't heard of orthodoxy, you know, yeah. so we, we hear of Christ, we can access the scriptures and there's something to that, our hearts become stirred. Um, and so when I, when I was, you know, in Ukraine and I experienced, you know, just, you know, encountered certain things and then reading about, um, you know, early Christianity, mm -hmm. I was really looking also for, for a, that, that ethos, mm -hmm. that, that, you know, that word meaning that, that, um, the same spirit, right. And when I walked into, uh, I mean, it's just a, it's a potent memory because I've been, but I remember walking into the, the church in America um, for a Vesper service, the first service I really attended and of course in English. And that's what just struck me. It struck me this, this is it. I felt like I, I walked into um, what I'd been reading about, and, you know, uh, Christianity and the Celtic Isles and things like that. So, so that, that whole life to, to understand that, that really orthodoxy is is a matter of of the heart and everything that we have comes from truly in the true sense our encounter with god with christ and everything that the saints that paul you know starting with this the i mean all the scriptures and what is this what are the scriptures but the the account of man's encounter with the living god mm -hmm. And, and this is what we have, to, this is what we're, we're guarding. It's not mine. And this is where orthodoxy is, you know, true, true Christianity is so important because it's that life in Christ to which I have to enter, to which I have to, to become a part of the body of Christ. Um, and that's, that's something so deep and profound. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's this, this understanding of, that's everything we have in the church is to reflect to us and to bring us into relationship with the living God. And, and of course it's twofold in the church, you know, there's, there's absolutely the importance um, of, of everything that we do, the rites, um, the dogmas, the doctrines, everything absolutely vital but the import, I think the vital thing to remind ourselves as especially Orthodox Christians, that all of these things flow from the saints encounter with the living God. And that there, we don't just speculate. We don't just have, you know, let's go speculate about, you know, something um, as became common, uh, especially in the West and scholasticism nowadays. And a lot of people are familiar with that. But this, the saints are speaking from that life in Christ that same Christ who is the same yesterday, today, and forever as the scriptures tell us. And so our, our goal is in everything that we have, everything that we have been given is to draw us into that life in Christ and that we can be transformed in the inner man. So these, all of the outward things that are absolutely vital are meant to transform the inner man of our heart. Mm -hmm. um, and, and because then we have to live that same life. We have to be living um, we have to be living the Orthodox life, not just, I mean, reading about it is absolutely important, 
but most important is to be living it. It's, you know, we have to be living prayer. We have to be living all of these things. Uh, and that's how we're going to, to keep it alive and, and reverencing that life. Um, you know, it's, it's a real temptation nowadays, especially as moderns, to think that we're, we'll improve something. You know, we'll, we'll make it better. Right. Um, and and we're, we're not going to because what we have is Christ and you can't make God better. It's impossible. Right. <laughs> it's impossible. And to, to think that we're going to do that is the utmost arrogance, mm -hmm. um, honestly. You know, and I'll let some people do it. You know, there's, there's varying degrees out there. They just out of ignorance or whatnot. Right. Um, but we're called to humbly approach Christ mm -hmm. or come to, um, to give, to, to really be transformed um, on, on the, the level of the heart. And this is, this is what counts because we have to become true Christians in our world. That's hard. It's, it's hard to become a true, a true Christian. Um, there's a little quote from another book, speaking of books, and this is one I'm just, I just keep recommending all over the place. Um, it's a, you know, in some sense, simple, right. But that doesn't mean, you know, it means it's, it's, um, it's at the same time, very profound. It's the saint to the prison. Um, and this is about the monk. I mean, the martyr Valerio. He was a Romanian martyr. Um, and, and, and so this, uh, let's see here. He, he tells us, and so he's martyred. He has quite the story. You can read about it. I would say another thing, read about uh, the martyrs, another emphasis you'll hear me emphasizing is in the past 20th, the 20th century, century uh, it was, it was the age of martyrs, you know, unparalleled in history. Um, more Christians were martyred in the 20th century than, than any time before, even the first 300 years of Christianity. Right. Um, and so we think about that, that's pretty prof profound. We, we live in an age of, of martyrdom. Um, but say, um, this new martyr Valero, he says, he says this, and I think we need to, you know, contemplate these things um, because our job is to, to, to understand not, not here necessarily, but as the saints say that the mind has to go into the heart, right. you have to be transformed by the grace of the Holy Spirit. But he says, those who understand Christ are so few. He says, I do not even mention that I cannot even speak of the extremely small number of those who live in him. In this life, faith is everything. Therefore, man without faith is dead. You know, and his words are so um, simple, but on some level, we, you know, um, the, the, the goal of, of faith in Christ is that we would know God. You know, he says, know the truth. And it's the, the West, we've, we've, we've made that just a rational consent, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Whereas knowledge, of course, in the Christian, it's, it's entering into communion with, you know, this is the whole thing of theosis and orthodoxy, the fancy word. <laughs> but, but really, it's, you know, and Protestants will say, oh, personal relationship with Jesus. And, you know, I mean, in their context, of course, I think that's, but in some sense, we can, we can take that and say, yes, where our person is enter, to enter into, by grace, communion with, with, you know, the divine trinity is another person. So we're called to uh, in our, you know, a personal encounter with God's person, of course, by grace, and that's theosis. Um, and we do that, we can do this because our nature has become united to the divinity through the incarnation of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ. And so that our nature and the saints tell us there's, there's no other nature that was chosen, not the nature of this. And it's a beautiful thing, not the nature of the sun, not the nature of the stars, or, you know, they go on this, this list, but it, it's human nature alone that is capable, capable of being united hypostatically in Christ mm -hmm. to the divinity. And because of that, that, that personal union or hypostatic union, then we become, again, communion, we become by the grace of God, what he is, we begin to share. He shares his very self with us by grace, by his divine, you know, divine energies. And we get into these kind of words, but simply put, we can say, yeah, that's in an orthodox context. That's it. Or my person has to encounter the person of God by grace and be transformed. 
So Father, would you then say that this is why we need the sacraments and we need to be with a church community living the Christian life in union in communion with our our church? I, I mean, absolutely. The this the sacraments, you know, the mysteries from the, you know the Greek word. I mean, sacraments fine. Um, but they're, they're mysteries and that God is giving to us. It's, it's like, you know, St. John of Damascus, um, when he talks about icons, and I think this applies, you know, across the board, he says, I'm, I'm, God has made me essentially summing up. God has made me both spirit and matter. And so I long to em embrace Christ with my, with my body even, mm -hmm. you know, because that's part of who I am. And so we, we acknowledge the reality of who we are as humans mm -hmm. um, and the sacraments. And it's also, of course, I mean, so there's a number of levels, forgive me, I'm kind of, uh, but, you know, we, we acknowledge then that, that matter that is created by God and then, you know, take all of it, uh, holy baptism, um, holy oil, holy unction. Um, Holy Communion. I mean, it all it all utilizes either water, oil, bread, wine, and these things then become empowered, infused with with God's grace, and we we then commune also with God's grace, of course, spiritually, but also through the through matter because God created it that way. That's not us just being, you know, trying to be fancy. It's, it's the way God has set things forth and he's made man as matter and spirit in man. You know, we're, we're the, we're the fusion of the two worlds, the spiritual world, the angels and, and so on and so forth. And the material world that we see around us and the two, the two worlds meet in man. And that's it. That's, that's man's unique vocation. Um, we're the, we're the, the touching point, the union point of the spiritual world, so to speak, in the world of matter, um, you know. So the sacraments, absolutely, it, 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 you know, we we become united to Christ through these things, and this shouldn't surprise us because Christ Himself outlines this in the Scriptures. Um, I mean, He tells His disciples very clearly that unless you eat My flesh and drink My blood, you have no life in you, um, and this this is very clearly a reference to Holy Communion. Um, so we, we're commanded, we're commanded. Why? Because uh, it's a participation in Christ himself. How? Well, the, you know, in orthodoxy, that's the beautiful thing. We say, and to some extent, it's, it's life in Christ, and life is a mystery. I mean, if we go around, and modern science tries to do that, but ultimately, life remains mysterious, you know, how humans interact with each other, how we, and there's the, a whole mystery to life that, that is beyond us, so to speak, even on the physical level. And the same thing, we just know we're alive. I mean, I wake up and I don't, I don't have to go sit down and computate, you know, am I really alive? Am I really? No, I'm just alive. Right. And in some sense, in life in Christ is similar. Um, and so these things give me life as I need bread, you know, physically to live. I need the bread of life to live. And he shares that with me uh, through, through the holy mysteries, which are indispensable, the fathers tell us, for the Christian life, you know, um, because they are imparting to us uh, the divine life of God. And that's, that's the work of the church, the whole, the whole of the church, really, we could say is a is a mystery is a, a sacrament she is the sacrament she is the mystery mm -hmm. and then of course we can speak about the the sacraments from there holy communion holy baptism you know so on and so forth um, but ultimately the mystery is the church the mystery is the divine organism of christ's body where he says you know clearly in the scriptures that the church is his body he is the head you know he he um the saint paul that is uh, you know, likens that to a marriage, you know, in the Ephesians. So we have all these analogies. He's, he's united himself. We understand, hopefully, we understand, you know, what, what real marriage is, true marriage is, and being united, you know, becoming, you know, one flesh. It's a mystery. That's a mystery too. Mm -hmm. But in, a, in the most profound sense, that's what God does with us. Mm -hmm. And the most profound 
deep sense and that's what this why the saints are so you know and all of us I mean, we're all at differing varying degrees um but but the lord desires to unite himself to us in of course a, a way that transcends as you know we know physical marriage um, but in a pure sense, as St. Simeon, the new theologian sense, but he desires to unite himself to us so that we become once again, flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. Uh, and that's, that's the goal of humanity. Uh, and we see that fulfilled in, in the saints. Um, yeah, Lord have mercy. It's beautiful. It is so beautiful. And so you write a lot on your blog about the world and how, you know, the agenda of the world is to keep us distracted and keep us away from knowing Christ and devoting ourselves to him. And um, so, you know, you write about transhumanism and how there's this attempt to find salvation in man and science and technology and just worldly dead <laughs> things. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in some sense, uh, not a lot changes, <laughs> but, you know, at the very beginning, the scriptures open up as, you know, and what's the temptation of man? You'll be like God without God. Um, you know, we can only be like God with God. And that's, it's, the devil doesn't take something that's, he never sells us a complete 100% lie, just never does that. No heresy is 100% wrong. It's just enough wrong to kill you. It's like St. Uh, Ignatius of Antioch says, I mean, kind of paraphrasing, but essentially he says, if you put one drop of poison in honey wine, it's still going to kill you. Yeah. It doesn't matter that it's 98% honey wine and 2% poison the poison will kill you and that's what we've understand so the devil always well here's the honey wine never mind the two percent poison right don't worry about that because it's 90 eight percent so in the beginning is it is it wrong you can be like god well that we were supposed to be like god that's the vocation of humanity it's not necessarily wrong but without god you'll be god without god mm -hmm. and that's the lie and so that's what we keep seeing and of course it always develops throughout history i'm sure there's been you know, manifestation upon manifestation of this. Um, but in our own times, of course, with, with the um, theories of Darwinism and, and all of these things that, uh, that gave man a new, as it were, narrative, um, supposedly proved that we don't need God, that, you know, we didn't come from God, this, the complete destruction of the Christian, um, you know, the, we would say truth, but let's say, you know, they would see it just as a narrative, of course. Um, but they think they completely destroyed that through science. Oh, see, we just came from whatever it is. Um, and now, and it, but if they they just keep thinking along those terms, if we're if we're evolving, if that's true, of course they take it as quote unquote true. If we're evolving, and thus far natural selection has been the one that has been randomly choosing, you know, whatever evolves and what doesn't, and so on and so forth. Um, well, let's take modern man has decided, well, let's take, we can take control of that now that we under, we, we supposedly understand that mechanism. We can take control of the reins of the whole process of evolution. Um, uh, and, and so it will no longer be natural selection. It'll be man right. will be the master of his own destiny. Mm -hmm. Not all of it, everyone, because they're not that way. It's the chosen few. Right. They, they have a whole system of how they think, you know, they've been chosen by history or by chance with all these things. Um, but the, the, it's, it's really the rehashing of this same thing. And of course, then when you get technology put into that, and that's what we see a lot of what's happening, I think, around us. I mean, for the Christian, our hope is in Christ. Um, where we never are looking at those things to be consumed by um, you know, by what the world is doing necessarily. Um, but the Lord commands us to be watchful. And if we're not, we can be led astray. He doesn't warn us without reason. And the reason is, he says, guard your heart. He says, be watchful. Because if we don't, then the implication is we can be led astray. You know, and this has happened throughout history. And so the guarding of our heart in the truth of Christ 
and the truth of the saints as given to us by the Holy Fathers is absolutely paramount for our times because we're being offered a new way to salvation. And it's not that it's atheistic necessarily. It is very religious in its manifestation. Um, and, and we see this in, in a lot of, you know, what is happening in the world around us, I believe. Now, is it, you know, we, we don't, we have to be careful, I think, because we don't want to jump, oh, it's, you know, it's the absolute end. I don't know. We've been in the end times, the scriptures tell us, since, since the time of St. John, the theologian. Now, obviously, we're closer to the end than anyone else before us. <laughs> you know, the, so here we are. We are truly the closest ones to the end of the world ever before, you know, right in this moment. But when that will happen, God knows our, our duty as Christians is to keep our eyes on Christ, to guard our hearts, to guard our minds, to guard, guard our souls, our body, our whole being, our bodies um, it, with the truth of Christ. And that's why the, the upholding of the truth of, of um, orthodoxy, you know, the truth of Christianity is absolutely vital. It's the only thing that will save us. And when we, when we sell that heritage to, you know, to satisfy the world, we're doing the greatest disservice ever, ever, ever. It's the, it's the greatest tragedy. Um, and there's, it's a temptation for Christians throughout all time to do that. Um, the church never will. It's clear in the scriptures, the church in her essence will never fall. The gates of hell will never prevail against her. Mm -hmm. But we as persons can fall. I can be led astray. I, I, that potential is there for me. And I, the only way I'm not is by guarding myself in the treasuries of Christ mm -hmm. through the grace of the Holy Spirit, of course. Mm -hmm. But we, ha we have it. That's, that's why upholding the Holy Fathers, um, making sure that we're not just quoting them, it's, it's, it's not, you know, it's not enough, so to speak, to quote the fathers, important, absolutely, but that we're of the same ethos, the same life um, that is, is flowing through us also, um, because we see a lot of people, even today, even some orthodox, you can, we can quote the fathers, you can, can become quite scholastic in doing so, you know, scholasticism is all about quoting, you know, people say, oh, that's Protestant, well, it's more than just being Protestant, you know, um, sure, we can quote the scriptures and mean totally different things. So the fathers can be used in the same way. The important thing is to understand the scriptures. We have to be in the life of the scriptures mm -hmm. and to understand the fathers. We have to be in that same life. We have to be making sure, checking our hearts and making sure that we're, um, we're, we're pursuing that same life. We're not just trying to use them to prove something of, of our own. And that's a danger. I think nowadays we want to, uh, update the fathers or update the Christianity, improve upon it. And that's part of this transhumanism. Mm -hmm. We're going to improve on it. Mm -hmm. We'll improve upon um, transhumanism. Ultimately, man is a faulty thing. It has to be done away with, thus transcended. We have to transcend our current humanity. It's demonic. Um, but that's the goal. I mean, that's the goal. We have to understand that. I mean, uh, obviously God, God knows, and he's, he's controlling all things. Um, he'll let things culminate. Uh, may, may we repent. I don't, I will, I gain no satisfaction whatsoever um, about, you know, the, the events in the world. And I, I, I fervently pray for, for peace and that we can all find repentance and that God will give us more time as he gave more time to Nineveh when Jonah preached to them. Um, but that's contingent on us really. I, I did want to talk about repentance a little bit, but first I found this beautiful quote on your blog. You said, anything that is done that is not clearly and evidently founded upon the divine humanity, the God man, and the principles of his incarnation is not proper or befitting. The incarnation is the standard for the operation of the body of Christ, the church, even unto this very day. And it's, that's just so beautiful and really fit with what you just said. And then um, here's another quote from your blog. It is impossible for the church to be the church without Christ, her Lord. If in the name of the church, the traditions and truth of Christ are abandoned in either word or practice, then one is left with only anti-church. Such becomes another church, a false church 
which must be turned over to anathema, for there is only one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And this is hard for a lot of Western Christians to hear. And um, I just wondered if you could add to this for us. Well, absolutely. I mean, I mean, I'll try. <laughs> Whatever mercy, Lord, give me grace. Um, we, we have the church because we have Christ. I mean, this is in the scriptures and, you know, anyone who is familiar with the scriptures, if they, even if they're not Orthodox, you know, you can search the scriptures and see as, you know, it says in the book of Acts. And we, first we have to, we have to understand, you know, why were we created? I mean, well, you know, it's again, humanity was created for, for to, to enter into life and commune with God. And, and the saints are clear paradise is, is the church, right? The church is the divine human organism, you know, organism body that, that the Lord established in which humanity and him commune with each other. And that's why it's, you know, we're members of it. St. Paul uses these, these, this imagery that we're, I'm, a, I'm just a member. I'm not the body, you know, I'm, I'm just a member. Uh, and so I have to be connected to the body to have life. And the body has, is always connected to the head. He's, he builds this whole analogy in the scriptures. And we understand it because I have a body, you know, we don't have headless bodies. We don't have what well, we do, but then you're dead, you know. So uh, life, life in Christ is found, and just as life for me is found in my body, uh, it's a simple analogy. And I, there's no life for this finger outside of my body. It just won't happen. Yeah. The body, this finger can't say, I'm going to go have my own individual relationship with the body on, it, on its own. Mm -hmm. And if it sever, was able to sever itself and go do that, it would die. It would wither away. Mm -hmm. It has to be connected. And so God has established this. It's not what I what I think it's I would say this this is the scriptural um, obvious scriptural uh, mode icon that is that is given to us and so it is it is you know the the vocation of the church is to stand for Christ Christ is always incarnate the saints are cl clear about that we had the incarnation but Christ is always incarnate is in his church. He's always making himself revealed to man materially even. And so we all, the church participates and that's kind of back to the, the sacraments and the mysteries. There are also continual incarnations in matter of the grace of our Lord God and savior, Jesus Christ of the Holy spirit of the father of their, their love and their mercy towards us. It's a, it's, it's physical, it's incarnation. We have to have the incarnation, Saint Athanasius on the incarnation, you know, and, you know, we become the saints tell us Saint, Saint Simeon and others, we become incarnations, so to speak, we we, we we share in that incarnational reality when I, when I am transformed by the grace of the Holy Spirit by the grace, you know, throughout the body of the church, again, that's the sacraments, it's all yeah. giving to me that life. And when I'm being transformed, then, then then I'm able to act together with Christ, just like in a true marriage, you're not going to, um, you know, ultimately we, you, we, we, as, you know, as a husband and a wife, we, 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 we attain unity and we're, we're one of mind and one of heart and we're doing things together. And that's, that's, and, you know, I've been married for, uh, it'll be 26 years uh, coming up here. You know, and the longer you are married, the more that that becomes a reality. Yeah. You know, it's just the more you find yourself in, in a good marriage founded on Christ. Um, and that that and it's a taste of that where you become one, as the scriptures tell us, uh, you begin feeling, thinking, even, you know, it's a spiritual phenomenon. And, and that's where marriage, you know, it just keeps becoming more and more beautiful. And sadly, of course, this is a rabbit trail, but sadly, in the modern world, you know, that's being attacked because, no, you know, yeah. people won't, won't stay married long enough, right. you know, mm -hmm. whereas marriage becomes an incredible, um, it, especially in Christ, because you just become more and more one 
in Christ because it's a sacrament also. Um, so that's, but um, back to the church. Um, the, the, Christ came to give us the truth and to set us free, to call us to the cross as Christians, to give us life and life most abundantly. And that's the same job as the church and we as Christians. So as members, that's what we have to call the we. You are the salt of the earth, the Lord says. You are the light of the world. And that's not just something, you know, a given to me, but as, as this is the job. Why is it the salt of the world? Because Christ is. Why is the light of the world? Because Christ is. And if we are to... Um, help our world to 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 give it life. Then we must give it Christ, and and we we have to get as so to speak, get out of the way and with all of our, you know, our sins, all of our passions, all of our our temptations in the modern age to know better than God does, mm -hmm. to know better than the saints do. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's why it's all kind of connected with what we were talking about earlier, also transhumanism and such things, because that temptation is manifesting itself in so many different ways, right? Um, and, and, and so we, we have to be very careful because Christ says enter by the, the narrow gate, mm -hmm. right? Straight is the way, difficult. And this is the way of Christianity. He says, if you want to live, then you have to die. Um, you know, to, to not, not, and he's speaking those terms because when, when I look from the world as I've been, you know, right, you know, so to speak, and just a normal, I guess, you know, as we know it, and we're, we're taught self preservation, we're taught self satisfaction, none of which is necessarily wrong but we we've we've infused that with passion you know with sin and so i have to as a christian i have to be able to empty myself of all of that to be purified by christ and so it looks like death because i think well if i give up my own will and the fallen will right then then what's going to happen to me well if i'm if if i and that's where Christ says, trust, you know, have faith, believe in me. And this is life. And we, we we're now fearful because of our alienation with, from God. And, and we're trying to preserve ourselves. But usually it's, it's through the passions rather than through Christ. And so when we lay down the passions from the perspective of the fallen world, it looks like death. Mm -hmm. So the Lord speaks in those terms. But really, that's the only way to resurrection. It's the only way to life. Um, it's the only way to be to be truly set free. And so we have to um, we have to let that that grace energize and purge us. And then we find. But when you do, you realize it's not it's not death. Yes, yeah, sure, it's death to the passions, but it's it's life in Christ. It's true life. And you begin to feel that more and more energizing. And the more you we give ourselves to it, uh, the more we become, as it were, alive and you know that's yeah anyway Lord of mercy. i have a quote here that fits perfectly it's about martyrdom and you said martyrdom is the willingness to suffer persecution rejection defamation and such for the revelation of jesus christ martyrdom may include a physical death but it is essentially a spiritual state in which a christian learns to live and I, when I was in the new age and, you know, I knew nothing about Christianity because I wasn't born, I wasn't raised, um, I wasn't born in a Christian household or raised to believe in Jesus Christ. So I, I really knew nothing about it. And as you, as is usually the case, people who don't know anything about something think they know everything. So I thought Christianity was the easiest path because all you had to do was just believe what your minister told you was true. And I was so wrong. And, you know, the new age is literally the easiest path because you can do anything. There's no, there's, there are no rules. It's all about subjectivity and relativism. So 
um, as, as difficult or challenging as Eastern Orthodoxy is, like you said, it's given me freedom. It's given me life. It's given me joy. It's given me peace that I never had, no matter how much I tried to meditate or whatever the healing practices were like crystals and psychedelics and all that stuff, searching for peace. I never had it. And now I'm starting to, to understand what it is and also understanding martyrdom and sacrifice and doing God's will and not mine. That's my goal. Of course, I don't succeed every day to be a selfless person, but at least that's what is, you know, saving my marriage, um, helping me gain new friendships with people who are also on this path and we're supporting each other through this and having priests and, you know, the guidance and support of the church and, and the parishioners, it's just priceless. And there's nothing that compares nothing in the, in the new age. And so that's another reason I started this channel, hopefully to um, help inspire people who were living in darkness, like I was <laughs> to at least seek the, the guidance of the fathers and attend divine liturgy and just see what it's like to be part of this, this worldview and this um, life, this new lifestyle, because it is a completely new lifestyle for me. Amen. Well, and, and yes, and that's, I mean, the, the, I would say, oh, maybe it's not the modern world. We just live in the modern world. So I'm addressing it as, and that's where I'm at right now. <laughs> that's where I, you know, God has, has given me to live in these times. Mm -hmm. And, but the modern world definitely is, is seeking itself. And, and that's, that's the, the problem. And, and so we look for, you know, spiritual experience. We look for religions, whatever we want to call it that that confirm that you know confirm these these things and and a lot of them i mean even from uh, you know and, and in orthodoxy we have to we have to guard ourselves obviously because we can fall to the similar things mm -hmm. but a lot of the western experience you know i'll just call it western I, i'm not super keen on that but i'll we'll, we'll call it for that for lack of a better um it is is exactly with that i mean even on a protestant level as a former protestant I mean, we're looking to other things, but it really becomes, you know, based on me and what I think about Jesus and, and about God. And there is no objective, you know, I mean, of course, we claim the Bible, you know, those things were claimed. But on a similar level, because this, this thing is, it's um, kind of prevalent, not, not just in New Age religions, not mm -hmm. just in, you know, it, but it's prevalent for, for whatever it, as a manifestation in the Western pursuit of spirituality, whether that be under a Christian context or whether it be under a, um, you know, more of a new age context, you know, whatever that might be. Um, but essentially we're still setting up ourselves as our own, you know, as our own uh, authority. Um, and, you know, in Protestantism, we would hear, well, I don't see it that way. I don't, I don't think the thought, you know, I don't see the Bible that way. I don't see. So, you know, we, we, you retain for yourself um, lordship of your own spiritual life right. and, and Orthodox true Christianity. That's exactly what we're being asked to lay down mm -hmm. um, the, our own fallen lordship, you know, and, and to seek after Christ. And that's not, again, it's not some, was he? I think we when I was we I've talked about it before, but you know if you love me keep my commandments. This is so vital, and the Lord the Lord invites us. There's no there's no force, uh, and so we we respond out of love. And so when we when we follow Christ, it's not just I have to submit. I just have to you know obey. And no obedience is never detached from love. You can't you can't detach those things. It's because God, God intimately connects the two. They're, they're inseparable. If you love me, then obey me. That is keep my commandments for my commandments are life. 
um, but he's not going to force us to do that in some sense, you, you know, uh, and that's, that's very different. So we, we have to lovingly, we have to freely as Christians give ourselves, enter into um, the narrow way, enter into, especially in, in orthodoxy. And that's why it's a great gift. And the great gift is, of course, we have the scriptures. Beautiful, incredible. Everyone should be reading the scriptures um, in the gospels, just feeding ourselves on the divine scriptures. But we also have the lives of the saints. We have, the, you know, all of this that is confirming the same thing, the, the writings of the fathers, the life of the church. Um, the, all of this is, is, is a reflection of that life in Christ. Uh, and that's what helps me to, to become really truly in my person without losing my personhood. I be become part of something that is eternal because God is eternal and his, his church is eternal. And so we, that's, that's the entryway. Um, and, and so that's, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and yeah, the modern world, I mean, it's, it's just, I mean, it's all tied together. New age, you know, the, all the things that all the spirits that we're dealing with and, and it all, that's the problem is, is that it'll, it will eventually, I mean, what is ultimately antichrist, antichrist is man setting himself up as God. And once, once we accept that, accept that we will save ourselves, uh, that we know better, in some sense, we know better than the fathers, you know, we know better than, then we're already priming ourselves um, and participating in, you know, in an antichrist type spirit, because, you know, ultimately, that's what will be able to be appealed to. You don't have to listen to God. You don't have to listen to this. We we will we will save ourselves by our own means, and that's essentially transhumanism, New Age. You know, um, and I would argue, you know, laid foundations laid by a lot of um, mentalities that, that a lot of Protestants weren't. You know, it's no attack on some Protestant. You know, so I hope if there's a Protestant listener, they won't necessarily take it personally, um, but that that unfortunately the mentalities that were cultivated uh, through the protestant revolution inevitably led to the mentalities of the modern age um where man is you know all the sense they said well you know saint theophon and he uh, really condensing what he does he says well the pope said i'm infallible man is infallible the Protestant Reformation said, well, why is the Pope the only one that gets to be infallible? Mm -hmm. We're all infallible as Christians mm -hmm. together with the scriptures, you know, of course, you know, Sola Scriptura, but essentially me and the Bible are infallible. And then rationalism said, well, why do you need the Bible to be infallible? Man's infallible of his own, in his own person, you know, and then, you know, we don't now a transhuman, you know, we don't even need uh, all of that, you know, reason, we're going to transcend even what it means to be human now. Uh, so that the steps we, you know, it's, it's, there's always steps. Um, there's always this progressive deception. Um, and we find ourselves where we are um, because of these, these things. So when we are able to see that, when we're able to, at least we don't have to be experts, not everyone has the time to go delve into all of that in depth, but if we can at least be aware of those constructs, um, those spiritual pitfalls, then hopefully when we were looking around, um, we will be able to identify them and say, oh, no, <laughs> I don't want to go that way. Um, you know, another book um, for the modern age, I would say that if people would, you know, it's a, an important one is this. Um, mm -hmm. It's by Archbishop of Verki, this struggle for virtue in the modern age. Um, that's can be found by at, by Jordanville. And he addresses, he's a patristic minded, very holy man, patristic minded um, writer, very uh, intent on respecting and, and, and giving unto, unto us the, the Christian mind. Uh, and, and so he addresses, he addresses a lot of the things we're encountering. So that's wow. why this book is important. I'm going to have to get that. I'm going to have to add that to my stack. <laughs> yeah, thank God. So. You... Um said this as well the final abomination will only be possible because the spirit was allowed to operate primarily in those places that should be temples of the most high an aspect of the abomination is to set the reason of the fallen world above the holy truth of revelation in the church it is to subjugate the holy things to the profane 
Yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, that, that, yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, what can I add to, to that? Uh, uh, it, and we, we see that, I mean, I, I would argue, not argue, but I would, I think founded on, I mean, we want to do things founded on the scriptures, founded on, 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 on the fathers. I mean, this is vital and we, we grow in that sometimes, you know, we, we realize and where we're, wherever we find we're not in harmony, we have to harmonize ourselves. I mean, no one can be a hundred percent maybe in line with the fathers immediately, but as we grow in Christ, we heart, we start tuning ourselves like a guitar and we find that I'm, I'm out here. And the, the temptation is to accept a new mind and, and we, we see this and again even in, in orthodoxy but it's it's all around us but we'll speak of our own house and and to give us a new uh, saint isaac the syrian and i i outlined this in one of my posts um about his in his writings about the degrees of knowledge and he clearly i won't i'll just mention the first one and he calls it common base knowledge, or he, sometimes he calls it natural knowledge um, in the kind of just the basic sense of, of that word. And it's knowledge that's completely concerned about material well-being, about the body. Um, it's, it's, it utilizes fear. It utilizes all of these, these assets. It utilizes the passions. Mm -hmm. But essentially, the problem is in the modern world, we've exalted through with the Western world, we've, we've made what we would call in orthodoxy base wisdom, the top wisdom. Um, of course, the secular sciences, we, you know, the sciences of the, the material world have a place, but Christ is the logos. For us, this, that's indisputable. That's revelation. That's, that's what God himself says. He's the divine. So to understand science, I have to know God. So I can see things, of course, but will I understand things correctly? That's a different question. Now I can, I can be a complete atheist. I can be a transhumanist, and I can be an expert at mathematics. Of course, it's possible, but will I understand? Right, mm -hmm. and that's that's the thing that Christianity is is concerned not with just base mechanics of of knowledge, so to speak, mm -hmm. but with true knowledge, and that is the divine logos. Um, and so when we begin to accept, you know, and, and you know, I'll, I'll just bring up from this last, you know, the, sure, let's listen, you know, medicine's good all day, but when we're just told trust, mm -hmm. just trust the experts, yeah. who, well, as Christians, we have to ask who are the experts, and I've addressed this, mm -hmm. and so that, you know, when I address that, that's what I'm, my concern, and I think based on the, the fathers has been that when we begin to just absorb into ourselves or bring over into the church this this kind of mentalities i think that are undiscerning because a lot of the experts are transhumanists a lot of the experts are you know involved in lots of things that are not for christ and his mm -hmm. kingdom so mm -hmm. obviously some of their information okay but what are the goals we have to be i think we have to be asking the deeper questions because that's what christianity does mm -hmm. It asks those deep questions, um, but if we're going to just bring over, and that's just one example, but if we're going to just bring over those things, well, what if the experts, you know, and the experts do tell us that as Christians, we're just stupid, really, you know, we believe in fables, God's not real, he's a construct of the human imagination to cope with our, our biological existence, um, he's a crutch that we've, we've created for ourselves because we can't deal with reality. Um, and, and so God is just a figment of the human uh, society, societal and, and cultural constructs. That's all it is. Um, and if that's good for you, you know, someone will that that's good. You know, if you like that kind of stuff, that's good for you, but they're there. It's completely antichrist. Yeah. It, it really is. Um, the other one I would just highlight is the, you know, the modern, modern ecumenical movement, ecumenism, um, because not, no, tr Christ is the truth. Um, you know, God have mercy on everyone. God will deal with persons, but we know, we know the truth and, and the truth is in the church, one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And as Christians, we, we have to defend that if we begin to, as sadly, some, um, do in, in, in even orthodoxy, uh, start talking about, you know, 
all our prejudices have, you know, kept us from seeing that, you know, there are many paths to, and so on and so forth. Um, it's, it, and we're not doing that in orthodoxy. I'm not trying to be a, a, a jerk. You know, I don't have something to prove. Oh, we're the only ones. It's, it's not my idea. It's not mine. It's the fathers. It's the saints. It's Christian teaching. I can't, I can't violate that. I can leave persons to God. I can do that freely, you know, and I, and I, you know, it's, it's like Christ said, you follow me, you know, uh, as humans, we want to know that people are like, Oh, what about the pygmy and, you know, uh, whatever, you know, it's probably not politically correct to say that, but anyway, you know, what about the someone in deepest, darkest jungle somewhere who never knew Christ, what's going to happen to them? It's, I don't know. God knows though. So I can be confident in that. What about me? When I confront, when I'm confronted with truth, you know, so we always trying to deflect sometimes as humans. So I don't have to really, or we think we don't then have to deal with truth in our own life. Oh, well, you think they're going to go to hell. I, I have no idea what's going to happen to them. I don't know. God knows. But I do know that I have to answer for myself and that I have to give an account to God for what I've done with my life. That's what I'm responsible for. Right. Um, and, you know, and then, of course, you know, as fathers, you know, that is in a family, husbands, you know, whatever those vocations, priests, of course, but then we get varying degrees of responsibility also. Um, so, Lord have mercy. Yeah. Wow. This has been so edifying. And I can't wait to listen back. I'm going to listen to this interview again, because there's so many gems so much and and i'm going to keep on reading your blog i hope my audience goes and follows you on instagram and you know every time you write something you announce it on instagram which i really like because then i know to go and read the next blog post so thank you for everything you're doing and do you have any final words for my audience or just especially somebody new to the faith Uh, I mean, let, let us all remember that our, our vocation, our vocation is to be transformed by the grace of the Holy Spirit and to enter into life in Christ. And everything that we have been given is for that purpose. You know, everything, that's, that's why the saints guarded it with their very blood because it's life because, and so I have to make sure that in my own heart, um, that's, that's the point of being orthodox, um, is, is that, that life in Christ. And, and so we have to, we have to dearly remember that, that when, you know, to, let's, you know, to guard our hearts, Christ, we're in, we're preparing as orthodox for, for great Lent. Um, and we just had the publican and the Pharisee. And so I guess I would maybe just end on, on that theme, you know, that he warns us about being Pharisees. That's for Christians, right? Because you can't be a Pharisee in the world. It's, you know, it's, it's a dilemma that we deal with, a spiritual problem we can deal with. Um, and that the problem is when we, the Pharisee was correct externally, completely correct. But internally, he lacked everything. You know, so it's, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll end with uh, this, this quote, maybe, and we'll just end on that. How's that? Um, and it's a quote from Father Sarah from Rose, but he's quoting St. Tikhon of Zadonsk. So he says, true Christianity does not mean just having the right opinions about Christianity. This is not enough to save one's soul. St. Tikhon of Zadon says, if someone should say that the true faith is the correct holding and confession of correct dogmas, he would be telling the truth. So vital, we don't throw that out. Right? Or For a believer absolutely needs to hold the confession of dogmas. But the knowledge in the confession by itself does not make a man a faithful and a true Christian. The keeping and confession of orthodox, dog, orthodox dogmas is always to be found in truth, faith in Christ. It's always there. But true faith of Christ is not always to be found in the confession of orthodoxy. 
The knowledge of correct dogma is in the mind, and it is often fruitless, arrogant, and proud. The true faith in Christ is in the heart, and it is faithful, humble, patient, loving, merciful, compassionate, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. It withdraws from worldly lusts and clings to God alone, strives and seeks always for what is heavenly and eternal, struggles against every sin, and constantly seeks and begs God for, for help. So I would say that's if we're interested, if we're coming to the church, absolutely correct dogmas, all of that, absolutely vital. But it has to be in our heart. We have to be Christians. We have to be feeling. We have to forgive one another. We have to love. We have to show that there's fruits of the Christian life, um, standing for truth, but doing that with love, um, you know, tr in the true sense, not the modern sense. So, so I, I would just leave your your listeners with those thoughts, especially from Saint Tikhon, uh, that we would take them to heart um, by God's grace. Thank you, Father, so much, and I want to let you know that I'll be praying for your family, everyone you know involved in this conflict that is going on right now. Um, everybody watching, please light a candle for those who are suffering everywhere in the world. Yes. And, um, I would like to remind my audience that my bit.ly link is in the description. You can find all my links, Instagram, my Etsy shop, my email, and my PayPal link. You may have noticed that I have a couple new icons on my wall, thanks to my beautiful godmother. Thank you so much. She's always gifting me things. And I have the icons on these really cool Velcro kind of things, so I'll be able to move them around. This is a work in progress, and I'm hoping to add um, Christ our King as one of the main icons where you see the baptism of Christ right now. So if you would like to contribute to my icon fund, you can do that by sending me any amount to my PayPal. And thank you all for sharing, liking, subscribing. You can find these videos now as a podcast on iTunes and Spotify. And until next time, thank you all for watching and God bless you. Bye.